hitting record, and let me officially welcome you, Ishwar Prashad. Am I pronouncing that well, by the way? That is perfect. Wow. Okay. All right. Cool. So welcome to Balls in Your Face Marketing. Thank you so much uh, for coming on. This is a real uh, pleasure for me to get a, get a chance to talk to you. Yeah, me too. Awesome. Cool, man. So um, I know you as a bit of a, a rising star on the Canadian small business scene. Uh, but let me introduce you a bit uh, to our small but growing international audience, because uh, they may not uh, know about all of your accomplishments over the last few years. Um, and I don't. I, I would say that the, the, you know that it's, it's it's pretty impressive. Um, you know, you were the uh, you were awarded the Small Business of the Year award at Camsey's yes, annual uh, business gala last year. Um, and let me put that in context for people. You're, you are the founder and principal of um, the Carter Bennett Group, which is in the industry of custodial services. So not an industry I would typically expect for innovation or much recognition. Um, so how, how, how the hell did you do that? You know, and sometimes uh, you, you know, I, made this, I made a decision based on need. Uh, you know, before I did custodial services, so I didn't get out of university and say I'm going to start a cleaning company. That wasn't part of my master plan. But uh, I was designing handbags. I was traveling all over the world. Uh, you know, did a lot of TV. And my, my company for the bag design was, uh, you know, featured in magazines. And it was an interesting life, but there was no money. So, you know, you have a family, commitments, and you think in terms of, okay, uh, what do I got to do? And I had a friend, interesting enough, who had um, started this business in Quebec, and I was in Ontario at the time. And uh, I said, "Hey, I mean, it, it, I'll help you with the sales and marketing." And uh, I just, I just found that other than it, you know, it's not exciting, but there was a great business there. And then I just jumped in, and uh, I've been making it work ever since. Amazing. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible uh, what you've done. And I know, and I think a big part of that success, um, I think is, um, I, I think culture, business culture is something that's very important to you that you're very passionate about. So I think that's probably a big factor of that. Why don't you tell me a bit about, um, you know, why that's important to you? Um, what kind of culture you're trying to, to create? Tell me a bit about your thoughts about that. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about that question, and I and I I realized that culture is everything. Now that could be culture in business, or it could be your personal culture or your personal philosophy, because businesses come and go, people come and go, but what you've got left is whatever you stand for, and culture is kind of that. And um, you know, part of our business culture it changes, right? But the root of our culture is always based on certain values, integrity, excellence, hard work. Those are the things that kind of make up the the soil. Um, and then the culture grows from there and, and it changes. Some things come in, some things go out, but the root of what uh, we stand for, and again, it could be business or it could be personal, never changes. And I had a conversation with a friend this morning who's going through this messy divorce and he did something yesterday that I, I said was out of character for him. And I said, I called him today and I said, you know what, I got to talk to you about that. Uh, and he said, yeah, well, she's, you know, She's doing this to me, that to me. And I said, you can, she can take your money, but you can't let her take your integrity. You, you really do have to stop there. And, yeah. you know, he heard it and he was a little confronted and then he thought about it. And that's, that's all about your personal culture. Like, what are you going to be standing for when people leave or businesses leave? Because they can take things from you, but you can't give that part up. So that's why it's really important in a business to have that firmly rooted. And it is non-negotiable, right? That's what we stand for. So that's why I think it's important. Yeah, no, and and I agree with you wholeheartedly. Exactly, like integrity um, is a big is a big factor. That's all you have, uh, yes. really. At the end of the day, I agree with that uh, wholeheartedly. So um, I'm not surprised. I mean, this is, you know, I, I, I you're just I, I find you a, a compelling character in so many ways. Um, I mean, no, but you know, because you're a bit unique and I'll tell you, let me explain a bit. So I met you a few weeks back. Uh, you were a panelist at the Globe and Mail Small Business Summit. Right. Um, and, you know, typically I find that um, entrepreneurs, there's there's a, a bit of a sort of a character mold. Um, they're usually fairly kind of bold, outgoing, outspoken, and so on. Um, and in a way, that's format where you were a panelist among many other entrepreneurs yeah, right. almost wasn't best suited for you because you're a very kind of soft-spoken wait until somebody asks you a question don't insert yourself very 
I, I respect it myself. I, I find I, I think it's elegant and graceful. Um, I, it, it speaks to your integrity, I find, um, um, to be that kind of, you know, to create space for other people and so on. Um, so, so yeah, no, I, I think it's, it's very interesting. And that's why in a way I thought, okay, well, I really want to sit down one-on-one -on -one with you to give you that opportunity um, yeah. to, to, to kind of talk about this stuff. funny you said that because I told my wife that and she's like, what? Because, you know, I could say I'm an, I'm an enlightened pothead superior guy. So what you saw or what you see took a long time in the coming because I was the guy that had to have the last, the first thing to say, the last thing to say. I had the best thing to say. I would say it over and over again. And, you know, over the course of the years, I realized that, you know, there's a grace to things. And you don't always, and I tell my daughters this all the time. It says, I asked them, who, who's the smartest person in the room? And uh, they said, I don't know, Daddy. He said, who? And they said, well, the guy who answers all the questions. I say, no, it's not the person who answers all the questions. It's the one who asks the best questions. Not yeah. answer it, but ask the best ones. And I kind of learned that. It's like, listen, stay calm. Uh, don't jump in the squeaky wheel doesn't get the oil all the time right you just want to be a little bit like you said a little bit graceful and um, yeah elegance a good word I never thought of elegant but that's a pretty cool word yeah and it's, it's something I have to learn I gotta be honest with you. well you know I, I've, I've had a somewhat similar progression that the older I get I find the more I want to listen to people who speak little oh my god yeah well, that's the best thing is like somebody who just keeps talking I, I actually have low, very little patience for the the palaver of talk, 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 and I'm like, okay. I just find, you know, if you can, if you can say something uh, in two sentences that someone else took two days to say, I think you're you're well ahead of the game here. So there's no need to complicate it. You could pretty much say what you need. It's like telling somebody you really care about, I love you, versus like writing poetry and sending them a book, a box of chocolates. You just say those two, you know, I love you, and it's over. And it's it's pretty powerful to be able to do that. So yeah, yeah. I, I practice that. It's not natural. Cool. Um, okay, so so how did you tell me a bit about the culture at your business and, and, and how have you tried to because I think ultimately in a business um, culture comes from the top. Right? Yeah, it's really, really cool. You, I thought about that, and one of the things I, uh, I the answer I came up with is like I insist that I be the way I ask other people to be. So if uh, I'm asking you to be honest and be great with the customer. I got to be that way with everybody. I also look and see, okay, am I doing the things I'm asking them to do? So if I say work really hard and I show up at 11 and uh, I leave for a three hour lunch and show up drunk, I mean, that's not doing the thing that I'm asking you to do, right? Um, yeah. And we all have roles. Uh, so I have a role to play as you know, the owner of the company, uh, to drive the company, to find great customers, to pay people, to get paid, and they have their role to do. So. It's almost like nobody's role is more important than anybody else's. We just have to do our role really, really well. And that's part of our culture. Demonstrate what you want and then just do your job really well. Um, that's, that's some of it. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that's, uh, that, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to say it because it's, it's pretty extraordinary. When, even when I look at it, I'm like, wow, we did that. that that's what happened. It's really, it's really cool, actually. Yeah, no, um, I, I, and I agree with that too. I mean, it's, it's, it's leadership by example, I think is what you're, what you're talking about. And that's always been something that, that I, I've always been interested in about leadership. How you, it's, it's, it's always struck me as funny when I worked in companies, how much people get hung up on things like titles. Oh my God. Yeah. Right. And it's like, you know, I've got, a, I've got a, um, just an uncle, uh, a family friend and he, he, you know, had some weird low title. This was at his company. I remember this story. I found it very instructive to me. You know, he had uh, worked at the same company for years and years and years, and he got up. The titles became a big issue at their business, and so he got up in front of everybody and he said, "You know, I've been in this company for for 20 years. As you all know, I'm now pretty much at the at the, the head of it. Do you know what my title was back 20 years ago? Um, and uh, you know, and it was you know." Um, you know, it was like a cog technician or something like that. So, right. you know, do you know what my title is today, everybody? Cog technician. You know what the difference is? That's right. Right. That's so, um, but again, it goes. It speaks again. It's uh, it's all about leadership. By so, I've never exactly. You can. You don't have to be the, the top of the, the person in in the company um, to be a leader within it. 
Yeah, and it's it's a flat surface structure, right? And so, you know, I'm not saying I'm going to go clean the toilets, although I have cleaned toilets back in the day. I had to do it. Uh, at the same time, I don't need someone to sit and, and sign off on checks and manage the finances. So if everybody's got their position. Nothing is more important than the next. It's all part of this organism, like arms and legs and teeth and hair. It all has to work together. One without the other, other makes something not work well, right? So, yeah, I, I, it's always how I've been. I always thought like that. And titles are just like, they just don't, I don't even, I don't even know. I barely put it on my cards. I'm like, uh, because people don't know. They see me and they're like, what do you do? What do you, you I know, I actually don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, and so maybe we should actually go back a bit into exactly like the sort of the making up, like how you became who you are, because and you and I were talking about this, um, I guess a week or so back where um, I could, as I said at the top of this, you know, you're sort of a rising star within the, the, the Canadian small business scene. But on top beyond that, what I would also say, too, is that I, I see you as somewhat of the embodiment of the Canadian dream. Yes. Um, and, and to contrast that against what, you know, everybody talks about, the American dream. Yeah, I guess the American dream, I would say, um, romanticizes the rags to riches story. Um, whereas in Canada, I think ours, our, we romanticize the immigrant family to riches story. So I know a bit about the background, but why don't you tell me a bit about that? Because it's, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, you know what? It's it, yeah, they're different. They're different uh, realities in Canada. I mean, we're all immigrants, and one of the things I always say is that whether you're a four-minute Canadian or you're a four hundred-year-old Canadian, you're just as precious. You're a Canadian, and uh, you know. It, so when we understand that we're all immigrants, our our story started simply. My dad came from a country, uh, Guyana, actually. Um, had to leave there. It was like racial strife. Um, got a scholarship, came here, but the first thing he had to do, he had to park cars because he was a teacher back home, but you know, they weren't hiring him as a teacher here. So, I mean, I remember my first experience was walking through, first time seeing snow, I'm gonna go see him at his place of work, I tell the story all the time, and you know, I, I see sees us, and he welcomes us into his place of work, I call it, and it's a three by three, you know, plywood shack, he parks cars, and he's got like a heater there, and he's got a bag of candies for me, and I'm excited, it's my dad, he's got candies, and I never understood that, right? Because I was just happy. I didn't know park. I didn't care. My mom would go off and do any job she could, and but she'd feed us breakfast. You know, it was like they're really hardworking, and I, I just didn't know until I got older. And I remember that scene in that plywood shack, right? And I, I remember the heater. I remember the bag of candies, but I also remember books everywhere. And you know, my dad was studying while he was in the in, in his place of work, and. Uh, I, I'm proud, like I say this all the time, he retired a few years back, he was a professor of political science, you know, he, had, you know, he taught so many impressive people from judges and lawyers, and my mom was, uh, she worked at McGill University in Montreal, she was a supervisor of library studies, and she retired, and I just, I didn't understand this until I got older, I watched what they did, and it is constantly an example that I try to set, um, because I didn't have to struggle that much, uh, but I watched what they did, and so in our business, I really, I have a appreciation for people that work that hard, that come from other countries, doctors who have to drive taxis, lawyers who have to go and work as uh, bus boys. And it's an extraordinary thing because it's not just, you know, people of color, you know, the Irish have to do it, the Jewish people have to do it, the Portuguese people have to do it, we all have to do it in Canada. And sometimes we forget that, that's where we come from. And that's why this country, I always say, extraordinary country, I mean, you know, we're backyard to backyard with people of different colors, religions, races, and work with them. I mean, it's extraordinary that we make it work. We can do more, I can, I can honestly say, but we're so impressive in this country about how we, we handle all Canadians. So uh, that, that's kind of the background. Yeah, yeah, no, well, likewise, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very proud Canadian. I'm a, I'm a first generation myself, but my, both my parents um, were, were immigrants, and that is, you know, one of the things that uh, about Canadian culture that I find somewhat sometimes frustrating is that I it always bothers me when um, Canadians um, define their identity in contrast to the Americans. You know, oh. we're not Americans. Well, that is not our culture. Um, you know, I think we're more than that. It, it, and I, one, I find it a bit, a bit of a failure to recognize, in fact, how similar we are. Um, but the one, but I think the only, really the only major significant difference, and it is a very significant one, is, is that difference of philosophy towards multiculturalism. We are the mosaic 
um, attitude. Yeah. Um, whereas, whereas America goes for that melting pot. Um, so I think that's that it's being reflected just here in this conversation that it's something that we celebrate and I'm very proud of that. Um, but, but, you know, obviously I don't want that, you know, we, I also, you know, want to be clear too, that, you know, um, when we compare those two countries, you know, uh, um, race is obviously a huge, big issue in the States. Um, and, and I don't like to present ourselves as being, well, you know, hey, we're better than that. Because, you know, we've got, we've got some, some dirty past, too. Um, you know, um, maybe we didn't uh, kill as many Native Americans uh, uh, as, as the Americans did. But what we did uh, to our Native American population is absolutely brutal. Um, you know, uh, you know we, we forced them out of their homes. For people who don't know that history, you know, we forced them out out of their homes, into schools, uh, under this sort of crazy idea that you can kind of, you know, educate the savage out of them. I mean, it's absolutely, and, and, and you know, that, uh, that legacy, uh, that dismal legacy is still an issue that we have to grapple with today in this country. Yeah, no, it's funny you say that because I was, uh, I was in the U.S. for a week. I went to a course down in uh, uh, New Hampshire. And uh, it was a minority course, so they had a lot of minority business owners from all over. And I had time to spend with black Americans. And sitting in Canada, I didn't understand it. I just said, you know, get over it. Like, I have to, right? You know, I have to, you know what, I don't have affirmative action up here. I got it. And so I went down there and I spent a week. And it's startling when you understand that they have a different path. They're, they're, the separation between whites and blacks in America is tangible. They just tangibly separated and uh, I had a conversation with someone and I said I know uh, Justin Trudeau uh, apologized right he goes up and he publicly just says it because it's important that a leader of a country just say it and I might just be you know fluffy but at least he said it and I was just saying what if the, a president of the United States went up and said I want to apologize to all black Americans for the atrocities that this country has performed on your people it'll never happen but in a moment, that whole country could transform. And I just thought I was, and it's, like we're talking about just some small words can transform everything. You don't have to spend a hundred years talking about it. You can just say that and it's over or start mm -hmm. something. And, you know, it's interesting. Canada has taken a different path. We got a long way to go still. Yeah. Uh, but we're, we're, we're well ahead of everybody else. I think. We're really good. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. And it's not, and I think it's again, more of the, the integration, especially in a city like, like here in Toronto, um, and I think the reason why uh, it bothers me in a way when people like say in Toronto, we're the most multicultural city in the world. That's sort of a ridiculous thing to say. Like, how do you measure that? That's right. 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 Well, but on the flip side, I think what people mean by that is that we are more integrated, less ghettoized yeah. uh, than a lot of other um, countries. You look at it, let's say like a country like France, uh, for example, where it is very ghettoized, and then you see sort of the, the consequences of that, of a, of a society that, um, you know, doesn't try to both sort of integrate and celebrate those, that diversity. Really, I think that's the, that's the key. I think that's the one thing that we did figure out is it's, let's celebrate uh, diversity. You know, it's funny, you're from Quebec too, right? So Yeah, I was born in Montreal, yeah. So I'm in I'm Montreal now, and there's this constant uh, identity politics that plays its Oof. which is, you don't see it in Ontario, because it kind of limits, you know, in Quebec. And so recently, uh, the, the, the CAC, who was running, the, the, the run against the incumbent party, have come up with a immigration test called the Quebec Values Test. It will require all immigrants to take a Quebec Values Test. If they fail it, they get deported. And, you know, just as we're, we're celebrating Canada as this amazing thing, just next door to Toronto is a province that operates like that, and it is so offensive. As I looked at that, I said, who gets to determine the values that one ethnic group gets to say that? And it, it was just, now, I, I, I came up with this thing, I read it in a great book, you know, I can scream at it, but light and air can do a lot more. You know, when you've got something going on, you just put some light on it, bring it up to the air and see what the what public opinion is and even how history is going to view this stuff. And then people, they realign very quickly because, you know, when they get, you know, exposed to that, they're like, wow, that, that really sounds bad. Yeah, it's really bad. Donald Trump said that it would make global news. Uh, uh, what, a values test and you get deported? Are you kidding me? Yeah. 
No, 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 no. I, I, yeah, I mean, I've, I've gotten into many a debate <laughs> with, oh. with, with fellow Quebecers about these issues. There you go. And it's, it is, it is fraught and emotional. And, you know, the funny, because it's, it's, it's so complicated, especially today, right? Like, because, I, you know, I agree with what you're saying on the side of, you know, hey, it doesn't take much to just acknowledge past grievances, show some compassion for um, historical inequity, some understanding about the fact that once uh, you, uh, you know, that it's not just something you can't just, um, you know, f um, free some free free a people or or just without without you know all the means and education. If there's all this sort of background um, abuse, yeah. it's it's hard to come back from. But and also the issue that we live in today too is of course this sort of heightened political correctness there's a bit of a grievance culture yes too so i don't i don't i don't have an answer to this i mean where's the balancing ground but but the, this is to me like we're definitely in a tumultuous time where it's it's very unclear you know the, I don't know. I don't even know where I'm saying. Like, it's just so confusing these it days. It is confusing because you, you said it because I think any answer is going to be an uncomfortable answer. And yeah. I don't think we can deal with, we're not comfortable being uncomfortable a lot of times, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you got to say it like it is and then you got to deal with the discomfort, you know, like telling your friends, uh, you know, calling them out on something. It's not a comfortable conversation, but you got to do it and you got to be okay being uncomfortable. And so, yeah, Canada, I think, can push a little bit harder with that. Um, but you know what? That's it's it's a great country, and we're we're on the right path, I think. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, look, um, exactly. I think all of this, hopefully, you know, yeah. will 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 sort itself out. Exactly. I think just having the conversations. Exactly what you're saying. Face face the the uncomfortable truths and sure. uh, and, and talk about it. I think my my view on 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 that too. I've always held this view that um, you know when people talk about you know, issues of racism and race and stuff like that. But there's this, I always have a bit of a sort of reaction to people when somebody says, for example, I don't see color, <laughs> right? And it's like, well, how, that's not realistic. And I think, and I think that's the thing is that you need to take it a little bit further is actually, no, see it, enjoy that. This goes back to what we were saying earlier, like yep. celebrate the difference. Diversity is such a great strength and asset. It is, it's huge. Yeah. I mean, it's huge. It's huge in everything. It makes everything richer and different. And you know, in business, diversity is a powerful thing to have. It's like yeah. a powerful asset. Uh, yeah. I mean, people of color, race, religion—you're just well equipped to uh, to take on anything when you have diversity. So yeah. Yeah, and there's a big need, I think, for it, especially today, because of how, you know, how much uh, sort of confirmation bias there is. You know, the problem—that's the big problem that I have um, with a lot of well, search engines, uh, social media, and so on, is that these algorithms reinforce um, our biases, and then you, and then it pushes everybody down to they just keep on getting the same same information and the same opinions and attitudes. Yeah. Um, so I think people need to actively um, seek that diversity in a way in their lives and look for that opposite opinion and recognize that you know if you just deal with it in sort of the personality kind of grid. Uh, yeah. idea that there's you know 75 percent of people are on another one of those grids right um so yeah. it's, it's you gotta it's, question a lot i think people today just accept what shows up on their screens and you gotta you gotta like just that just take a pause and say okay does that make sense really <laughs> did hillary clinton actually do that in the lunch room i remember reading that for donald trump's like really do you think that really happened uh, maybe let me let me check some sources but, yeah uh, yeah, we yeah I, I don't know if you saw this the other day. So there was the um, the, the monk debate uh, the other day. Stephen Fry uh, was was one of the debaters in that, and I, I was just blown away with how eloquent and and how brilliant uh, he was. He was dealing with this issue because, in fact, they were talking about that. It, it was um, a debate on that issue of political correctness. Right. Um, and he quoted somebody that was basically the fact that you know the the unfortunate reality of our time. Um, is that people who are certain are 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 stupid, and and um, pe people who are filled with doubt and and questioning things, um, you know, I, I don't remember the full quote, but roughly that. That so it, his point really is let doubt prevail. Let's let's sort of tone down the the, the 
how certain we are about everything, um, I think it's important to to do this to ha just like talk um, and 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 explore ideas and exactly be willing to maybe be a maybe offend or be offended, but you know, um, you know. Absolutely. I mean, I, it doesn't feel good, but it, it takes it, it makes things go further, right? Yeah. And you've you you faced that like you faced discrimination yourself growing up, right? You know, it's funny, you guys. I, I, I remember the first time I realized I was different. I was, I was, I think, 12 years old. And we had just moved to the suburbs of, uh, in Brossard, if you know the geography of Quebec. And, uh, the first time I heard a racial slur, I, I never heard it before. And I went home, I talked to my dad about it. I said, this guy just called me that. And he looked at me and he made up something. And I was perplexed. But that began this weird voyage where, wait a second, I am different. Like my skin is different, mm. and I, you know, you have to go through that voyage where you, you kind of complete it, you get the good things from it, and then you, you have to park it. You mm. can't walk into a room with that. I used to have a chip on my shoulder. Anybody looked at me a certain way, I was like, oh yeah, just I'm a brown guy. I mean, I always had it. And I have residue of that, but I, I realized that is not going to empower me in life. So like, I got to park it, right? Um, but you get reminded very often about racism in Canada yeah I'm across the border and you know I have white friends but they only ask me for my passport I'm like okay but I don't care I let it bounce I just give my passport and they ask me a few questions and I just move along so yeah you know it's startling when it happens because you just don't get it it's like well how am I different I speak like you I eat like you I walk like you what's what's different about me well your color of your skin is different oh mm -hmm. okay and my children are biracial so gonna be interesting and they don't see it right I always say oh dad you got the brown guy and I'm like daddy what do you always have to say that because they look they look cocoa right they're not really they're not brown or white so it's a, it's hilarious but it's part of what makes me who I am so yeah I remember having this discussion with someone about um, the comparison again between uh, Canada and the US and and you know I was saying well I think we've got a better we're doing better at it but their their argument almost was Actually, it's almost worse here because in the states, at least, like you know where the line is. It's it's out in the open, and what they're saying is, you know, that that people, it's it's that subtle racism that it's not, someone's not coming out actually and saying it, but it's like they cut you off or or something like that. It's it's. So, I, I, got, yeah. I got a good story because I, it's to that point, right? Where um uh, like so yeah, it's subtle. Canada, it's all quiet. It's all undertone. It's all that. America, it's in your face. Yeah. So I, I remember um, I, I, I was, uh, had a friend, a girl, and uh, we were dating. She wanted me to go meet her father. And I said, okay, no big deal. We're going to go see dad. And we're in Quebec at the time. And we went to this restaurant slash bar. And there he is. And he's happy to see me, right? And, he, you know, it's bilingual, right? So he's speaking in English. And, and then he, we sit down. And I see all these guys milling around and I'm like okay then his friends come over and they're smiling and it's all fabulous right and uh they start speaking in French they don't they, I, I understand French right so they're speaking in French and they're not saying nice things they're like where did she find this thing from like thing from where wow. they're going at it right so he would joke with them in French and then he turned back to me with a beautiful smile and talked to me about everything and I am steaming right I'm like what the and but it's the father so I didn't say anything so after I am um, I remember going home and I'm upset and I call one of my friends, he's a, he's a black guy, right? And I said, this is what happened. That dude is lucky because I was going to, I was in a tear into I was going to, he said, you can't do that. And I said, why? He said, listen, you got to operate like you're an ambassador to your people. Yeah. And you got to consider that everybody that meets you, you are probably the first person of your color, your whatever that they're ever going to meet. And you want to conduct yourself with grace and dignity because people come after you are going to be measured against how you operate. And I always remember that. Uh, uh, any room I go into, I don't care if it's a room of rednecks and racists. I will conduct myself a certain way because I know I'm an ambassador of my people, and that's how I've always been. And it was one of the best pieces of advice because it would have it would have been one of those constant battles, right? Fighting everybody, and I don't have time for it, and it's not fair to anybody else after me. So. Yeah. No. Well, you know, I mean, one of my one of my life heroes is Nelson Mandela, as as, a, as a, for a lot of people, and also that's that's so on my mom's side. That's where uh, she was born in South Africa. In fact, my my great grandfather um, was the South African uh, consulate 
uh, to, to Canada from South Africa years and years ago, and specifically because, um, you know, being in Parliament, he was opposed to apartheid, so they shipped him off to Canada, right? Uh, get him out of the country kind of a thing at the time. Um, but exactly that, that I mean, obviously, you know, in, in a country like that where you had years of oppression and obviously when he was, I was actually in South Africa the, when he was elected. Um, and, um, and, and yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, there was, there is this reaction, obviously, when people finally sort of regain that power to, for revenge. Yes. And he really led the way uh in terms of saying exactly what you're saying exactly what you're saying right like no you you know you, we need to show them the compassion that they didn't show us uh, to wow. to to rise above that in um and, and show a better example now I ve i'm very worried these days uh because unfortunately without him i find that they are slipping back to that kind of yeah. revenge mentality it's 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 yeah sending into a bit of a banana republic, I, I, I worry a lot about that country because it's so beautiful and, uh, and amazing. If, you, if you've never been, I, I, like, when you go there, it's in your blood. You feel it. There's this genetic memory. It's because it's, obviously it was, you know, I'd never been there before. I'd seen pictures and so on. But when you're there, you know that's where we came from. We all came from. That's amazing, though. Yeah. Yeah. I've never been, and uh, yeah, we're following the politics of South Africa now, and it's just degraded down to greed and avarice, and oh, and the crime and the murders and the flames that uh, those uh, the Indian brothers have from Bombardier. I'm reading, I'm like, what the heck is going on over there? But you know, I think you know people like Mandela don't come you know come along often. No. And, uh, you know how he was at the end of you know when he came out of jail was very different probably at the beginning. So he learned, right? So, mm -hmm right path to make things work you can't blow things up and fight it's just not going to work mm -hmm. uh, but you know that's what charisma does if you have somebody who's a charismatic leader that can actually uh you know inspire people to be better i think is always you know an, an important part of it and not just you know be basic and try to take care of your your greed your need your revenge your lust you know you've got to be grander than that and uh, there's not a lot of leaders that can do that yeah yeah, right here. Okay, so let me let me wrap wrap this up maybe with with uh, just some, any sort of advice um, that you might have for other small business owners, entrepreneurs. Yeah, it's funny you ask me that because I always was always in my head thinking somebody asked me advice. What would I give them? What would the top ten things be? And then I said, I am not giving them top ten things. It's almost as if I give you the top ten things, I'm fooling you. If I say, well, you need to do this, this, and this, because that's not what it takes. So that's kind of important, but I've always felt that there's other things that are underlying that. So I, if I give you top 10, you think you can swallow those 10 tablets and your, your presto, it happens. It's not that. I think there's steps that uh, all successful people go through. They're just, you know, how to be a good person manager, how to be a good time manager, how to be a good money manager. But I think the most important thing is how can you be an emotional warrior? I think that's the most powerful thing you got to learn not just in business but in life and um i studied people who are you know who are really successful and what i noticed was it looks as if everything's so effortless for them they just they just go blow through everything nothing sticks to them and what i, I learned was emotionally everybody goes through the same thing the upsets the failures the resignation but one of the things that successful people figured out is the art of quick recovery so it happens, they recover. It happens, and they recover. And what you see is the seamless thing, but just like it seems seamless, but they they don't pull up a chair and sit there for five years sulking. And I, I have to learn that. So emotionally, quickly recover from something. Learn what you need to learn, figure out what was missing, put it in place, get on to the next thing. There's no time to pull up a chair. So all of that stuff, uh, I say for entrepreneurship or success, you can't skip those steps. You can move through them quicker than most people. You could. You know, maybe you could be a great money manager, and that's nothing to you. But maybe you got to work on the time part. And maybe you just, but you still can't skip it. You've got to move through it. So all the top ten stuff that I was thinking about, it's not relevant until you get that core stuff handled. Um, and the emotional part, I think, is is hugely important. You've got to be resilient, and you got to, and that's not natural, right? You've got to work on that part and recover fast.
Yeah, no, I agree with you. Yeah, minds, it's mindset, um, and it's and it's and it's hugely important. And I think what you're 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 capturing there is a part of most entrepreneurial stories that people skip over, right? Which is exactly it's sort of like you know, hey, I started this and I did these right things, and poof, you know, we were well. But, uh, there is no such thing as overnight success. Nobody's ever you know built up like something like really that that quick well i don't know maybe facebook <laughs> facebook or something like that no, it's, it's funny you bring it up because uh, you ever hear this uh, ten thousand hour thing right where if you put ten thousand hours into something you'll be a master at right and then they, they look at tiger woods and they you know at 18 this guy is he's winning tournaments and i'm thinking at 18 you know what was i doing but the better question is what was tiger woods doing at three right playing golf yeah right so he was like all of that, like you said, it's not overnight. This is hard work. Yeah. You put the time in, right? And uh, we get to see the uh, the Facebook story, like Mark Zuckerberg just showed up and he got a billion dollars. But we didn't see how he had to study and sacrifice. I mean, he probably, I don't know how he sacrificed. But anyway, but you know, how he got to Harvard and, you know, it, it's, it's. Yeah, I know. And, and, and his story is sort of the exception to the rule. I mean. In, Always, yeah. yeah. Um, you're no, absolutely. Man, this has been Amazing. I think what yeah, you just said was, I think, I think what you just said was, was really profound, better than, than a top 10 list. Um, this is, this is amazing, man. So thank you so much for coming on um, and, and talking with me about this stuff. Um, um, so check them out. Uh, Ishwar Prashad, uh, the uh, Carter Bennett group uh, here in Canada. Um, I hope, uh, I hope uh, we get to see and hear more from you um, as the years go on because I know, yeah, you're just going to keep on, you're going to keep on going. Well, you make me so feel, so, I like how this, it's making me blush. You can't see it right now, but it's, uh, there's a blush going on. There's a, there's a blush. Okay, man, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I've got big fun.